message today is that any challenge to the central government will not be tolerated. From China's central government's perspective, the most important thing is that peace and stability will be maintained in Hong Kong. If it still cannot figure out which direction to turn, then it will be left behind because the 12, a dozen cities also in the Greater Bay Area, each is very dynamic. But with the city only halfway through a promised 50 years of high degree autonomy under the one country, two systems model, some human rights groups and foreign governments have accused Beijing of going back on its word as activists and journalists have been arrested, media companies ordered shut and voices from the opposition camp effectively silenced. Analysts say the anniversary will be an opportunity for China to hit back at criticism from the West and double down on its position that Hong Kong remains its internal affair. There has been much speculation over whether President Xi would make a visit to Hong Kong like he did in 2017 to attend the anniversary celebrations, this given a spike in COVID-19 infections in the city. But the fact that he is making a trip, experts tell me, is of great political significance, not just because this is the first time that the Chinese leader is making a trip outside of the mainland since the pandemic began about two and a half years ago, but also because this comes just before a closely watched twice a decade party congress that's to take place later in the year. It's after all personal for Mr. C, who is seeking an unprecedented third term in power. He will actually um, claim and also uh, announce that Hong Kong now has changed from situation to very much in a vibrant uh, economic in, in general Hong Kong is in good shape including uh, fighting COVID-19. So he could utilize this opportunity to claim that uh, all um, good things happening under his leadership. And it's unlikely there will be any signs of dissent or protest during Mr. C's visit this time, as tough security measures have been put in place to ensure celebrations go off without a hitch. Olivia Xiong, CNA, Beijing. <laughs> A messenger of peace hailing from Asia. Indonesian President Joko Widodo has met his Ukrainian counterpart Vladimir Zelensky in Kiev, and he's offered to bring a message to Russian President Vladimir Putin, whom he meet next. It's unclear what that message might be, but President Widodo is the first Asian leader to visit Ukraine since Russia's invasion in February. He and his wife were shown around Berkeley. That's the city which the mayor says sustained 70% damage to buildings from the war. Mr. Widodo also visited a hospital in Kiev where he donated medical supplies. Sangat menyedihkan sekali banyak rumah-rumah yang rusak, kemudian juga infrastruktur yang rusak dan kita harapkan uh, tidak ada lagi kota-kota uh, yang rusak di Ukraina akibat perang. Indonesia is the current G20 chair. President Widodo is also one of six leaders appointed by the UN to address the fallout from the Ukraine war. He has urged the leaders of Russia and Ukraine to engage in peace talks and has promised to help Ukraine rebuild. Mr. Zelensky has accepted an invitation from the Indonesian leader to attend the G20 summit in November. It's unclear if he will travel to the venue in Bali, but Mr. Zelensky says the onus is on Moscow to stop its hostility before any talks can be meaningful. Russian oligarchs, Ukrainian hosts, sports, and we know the agrarian export of our country in full obsession. Russia shantages the world with cold. She blocked the exports of products from Ukraine, which played a role in stabilizing the world market. Mr. Medvedev's visit comes as battles rage in Ukraine's east and south. Daily shelling has been reported in Nikolai, a key region which Russian forces are keen to seize. Heavy fighting also taking place in Nishishan. And we spoke with George Shufinson, Associate Professor of International Relations at Boston University. He explained how the alliance is navigating its expansion through the challenges posed by Russia and China. 
Well, I think the fact that you have a planning document, these documents are only revised every 10 years or so. So including China as a threat, as a challenge, is actually a very meaningful political development. But I think for the near term, for the medium term, Russia is going to be the focal point of NATO activities. What we might see emerging, though, is greater alliance cohesion in a diplomatic and a technological sense to confront Beijing's efforts in Europe and beyond. So I think this is less going to be a military switch from Russia to China, but more of a shading of technological, diplomatic, and political attention. I think, though, that with the emphasis on Russia and China as the major focal points of NATO, we're going to see the alliance really emphasizing the hard security, the hard defensive task, similar to what they did during the Cold War, to the extent cyber and hybrid and so on factor into the equation. It's going to be the question of how those issues affect the defensive burdens on NATO's eastern flank versus Russia and in the alliance's approach towards Beijing and beyond. South Korean President Kim Jong Sabyeol has called on the international community to denuclearize North Korea at the NATO summit. He called on the North of Australia to challenge the peace on the Korean Peninsula and in the world. President Kim Jong Un said the international community is clear that the will to denuclearize Pyongyang is stronger than its reckless will to develop nuclear weapons and missiles. This, as he met with leaders of the US and Japan on the sidelines of the NATO summit. Talks centered on the threat posed by North Korea amid Pyongyang's prolific missile launches and threat to resume nuclear testing. The three leaders voiced deep concern about the provocations by the North and agreed on the need to boost trilateral cooperation, saying it's crucial to resolving issues in the region. Our trilateral cooperation, in my view, is essential to achieving our shared objective, including a complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and a free and open Indo-Pacific. The meeting marks the first trilateral summit in five years and the first time the three men had gathered in an effort to bolster ties. Relations between Tokyo and Seoul have been strained over memories of Japan's occupation of the Korean Peninsula between the years 1910 and 1945. Despite the differences, the leaders agreed to pursue extended deterrence in the face of the common threat posed by the North. But there have been no concrete measures coming out of the meeting, apart from the vows to boost cooperation. Kate Fisher with more on the significance of the summit. I think the very fact that this uh, trilateral summit happens uh, is something that can be seen as a positive. These three leaders sitting down together publicly and reinforcing the message to North Korea that they were working together to defend themselves against any provocations. The US Biden administration, one of its priorities is to deepen the ties with its Asian allies, Japan, South Korea, repairing those frayed ties it's had with Japan and strengthening its relationship with South Korea. It knows that is the main way to try to dissuade Kim Jong-un from with those missile tests. We've had multiple missile tests already this year and military analysts think that there could be a nuclear test on the horizon that would be the seventh that North Korea has conducted and the first since 2017. Suggestions Nine. that even it could be this holding <laughs> Independence Day weekend coming up. Kim Jong-un in the past have used those kinds of US celebrations to make launches. So there is a real need, Joe Biden has said. He's deeply concerned about it and he understands it and he says he's concerned not just for the region, but for the whole world. Up ahead on Asia now, Australia's plan to coach overseas teachers has been oh, the name yeah, of yeah, yeah. the country to go on strike. And later, a look at what Malaysia is doing to become an international archaeological tourism destination. Very simple. I'm in Johor. Double hatching ass from chicken farm. Are these chickens good? Yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. I want to find out what it would take to stabilize supplies in Malaysia. So is having a close house actually helping the management? Well, along in the expert bank can create more shortages. When will we get our fresh chickens back? Talking point. Friday from CNA. Quoted by Sims, the DNA is
this episode, I kick a dip in the world of Samba. The boy in every possible one to have the partner of all Samba. Samba Kaiminya. Kaiminya is literally dropping. The end result is a, a far superior sauce. In such a piece, Samba is here. Tuition's aren't good enough. Tuition's aren't good enough. Tuition's aren't good enough. Tuition's aren't good enough. 